here this morning to actually make a confession to you, uh, a confession to a lifelong obsession. And that is that ever since I was a child, I've been fascinated by laneways, by the, the forgotten places in our communities. These are the vacant lots. These are the, the hidden places. And for me, they held the sense of wonder, a sense of being able to explore and never knowing what you'd actually come across in these spaces. This unfortunately drove my, my family crazy because like all of the other normal people in this world, um, they would, when they wanted to go for a walk, they'd go down the, the places that they were supposed to go, which is the sidewalks and the front yards, past all of the things that people wanted them to see, the nice lawns, the, the manicured flower beds, and the, and the pretty cars. That didn't interest me. I was interested in what was behind that facade and what was behind that mask. And that's what I found in laneways was the ability to, to, to peer over a fence and to see what was behind behind the things that people wanted you to see. I found a, a realness there, an authenticity there that just absolutely captivated me. I grew up to become an architect, um, in part because of my fascination with spaces like this. But what I discovered as I started to peer into other laneways across the city was that they weren't the same positive experiences that I had had as a child. In fact, these were places that were dominated by feelings of fear, uh, by, by garbage trucks picking up uh, garbage bins, by, by service vehicles, by you know, discarded needles and, and people that had to sleep there because they didn't have anywhere else to go. And I started to understand that these laneways were actually representative of the larger forces that are, that are shaping our cities today. And those forces are to do with things that are not about people. They're to do with land economics. They're to do with uh, planning and, and zoning policy. They're to do with, with power, politics, governance. And that those, so in a sense, these, these laneways are, are representative fragments of how our cities are crafted. And the one thing that was absolutely clear to me is that people certainly didn't factor into that list. Laneways were this, were this unique space where you could peer into the guts of the city, where you could understand what actually shapes the city. And what I found there wasn't, wasn't all that inspiring. One of the most powerful questions we have at our disposal is the what-if question. And it's because it takes us out of the realm of our current constraints and the boundaries that we're, we currently find ourselves in every day and it allows us to, to paint a picture of what could be, what is truly possible. I get to work with an awful lot of talented folks at, at my firm, which is HCMA Architecture and Design, and we started to ask that question about the city that we love, the, the city that is dear to us in a pretty serious way. We started to ask the what-if question about different parts of our city. We started with the harbor. All of you know that our city has this thing called the seawall, and the seawall does one thing really well, and that is move people back and forth along the seawall. Rollerblades, strollers, bikes, you name it. And it, it moves people awfully fast. One of the things it doesn't do is actually allow you to engage with the water, which is a crying shame in my opinion because water has this, this transformative potential. It's a magnetic material that brings people together. And so we started to ask the question, what if the harbor was a place for people? What if it allowed people to actually engage with the water? And so in the middle of one of North America's busiest harbors, right next to the, to the freighters, right next to the seaplanes that are landing, we uh, came up with a concept for something we called Harbor Deck. And Harbor Deck was simply, it wasn't a, it wasn't a dock, it wasn't a pool, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a park. It was a new form of public space. And, it, and its mandate was simple. Allow people to re-engage with this thing we call water. So you can come here, you can sit, you can take a load off, you can meet somebody you've never met before, you can, your kids can splash in the water, you can take a selfie. I don't know if this is ever going to get built, but we, we started to understand the power of asking questions and casting a vision based on those questions. And quite frankly, we started to get excited by the questions. So we, we, we started experimenting with other ways of asking the what-if question. We partnered with Simon Fraser University and um, we brought together over 100 people from all walks of life. These are creatives, non-creatives, and ordinary people. We brought them together for one afternoon with a single mandate. And that mandate was, make one small part of your city, this city, better for one day. Make it a place for people for one afternoon. That's it. And so we had a lot of fun. We, we put people into random teams, gave them random sites, and very small budgets. And then we unleashed these 100 people on the city. And, and the impact was transformative. For one afternoon in our city, the city that you and I know, it was changed. People would walk through a space they'd walked through a thousand times on the way to work and saw it in a completely different light. They stopped and had conversations with people that they had never met before because of whatever, something funny was happening on the street corner. 
And we started to understand what could happen if we started to apply the what if question, the what's possible question to the cities that, that we live in. Um, but it wasn't enough. We, we had this, this amazing experience on a rainy November afternoon and we under, started to understand what the impact could be. But we got greedy. We wanted that impact to be bigger. We wanted, we wanted to have a, a bigger impact. And so not unsurprisingly, that took us back to laneways. And we started to ask the question, how do we make laneways a place for people? How do we take, uh, take it out of the realm of service, of power, infrastructure, of fear, and, and put people back in laneways? And so we started. Um, we started, and we started partnering with the local BIA. We partnered with the city. And we started spending time in these spaces to really get to know them, to understand them. Um, we put up cameras in them. We put students in the alleyways to count people. And we started to uncover some really interesting things. Um, firstly, and not so unsurprisingly, um, the, the majority of the traffic in these spaces is really vehicle driven. So it's garbage trucks, it's service, it's delivery vehicles. But we also discovered that the people that are traveling new, through these spaces are really just traveling through. They're not spending any time in, in those spaces. And perhaps most surprisingly, we discovered that the ratio of males to females in, of the people that were traveling through that space was heavily weighted towards males which tells us that this isn't a space that's welcoming for all people in our society. It's not a space that is safe. It's not a space that is inclusive. So we took all that data and we crunched it down and we came up with an idea. And the idea was something we called alley-oop. And really it rested on, on one fundamental notion and that is that in the heart of what is characterized in this part of the city as a, as a financial district, a place of commerce and business, we would introduce the notion of play as a fine-grained kind of insertion to the character of the existing neighborhood. And so we started planning, we, we do what we do as architects, we design, we sketched, we drew, and then we started throwing paint down. We covered the walls, we covered the floors in bright colors of paint. We, um, we put court markings on so people could play basketball, um, so that people could kick a soccer ball around or, or hockey, play hopscotch. We wrapped the cafes around from the end so you could sit in the alleyway and just have a coffee. And then we invited the city in uh, to their new space. And the, the, uh, the reception it received was overwhelming. People instantly, even beyond the initial opening party, people accepted this space as a new part of their community. It was overwhelmingly adopted by all, all members of our society. You, you can go here on a Friday night at 11.30 at night, and there would be people playing basketball in this alleyway. The local language school now does their phys ed classes in the alleyway. People, complete strangers, come by and, and they talk about what's going on in this space. It took uh, Instagram by a storm. It became the, the selfie darling for, of Vancouver for, for a long time. And, and we have pictures of stuff that we had no idea ever would have happened in this laneway. And we learned some really interesting things. We went back and actually measured the, the statistics. Um, and what we discovered uh, absolutely floored us because the foot traffic tripled simply because of this small intervention. It tripled the amount of people that were spending. And they weren't just, they weren't just traveling through, they were spending time in the space. Their, the duration of, of, of stay in that space had, had grown dramatically. We also discovered that um, the ratio of female pedestrians had gone up by almost 50%, which was, which was really satisfying for us. We also discovered that this isn't necessarily, um, it, not everybody adopted this change in the same way that we would have hoped to. Uh, we sat down with the planners the first time and um, we had 20 engineers sitting at a table trying to figure out how to shoehorn this thing through some sort of a permit. It wasn't a mural, it wasn't a, a building and it certainly wasn't a public art piece. And so they were scratching their heads for a while on that one. We also discovered that psychiatrists really don't like the sound of basketballs being bounced off of their office walls <laughs> when they're in the middle of a session. And we also discovered that the people have different ideas of public property. Uh, and in fact, this gentleman here decided to walk off with their basketball hoop about three weeks ago. So if you see him walking around, we would like our basketball hoop back, please. But the most important thing we learned is that you can have a dramatically, disproportionately large impact with small change. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be expensive. Uh, we're moving on to the next thing. Uh, this is Acre's Alley, and we're going to envision a, a micro-performance space in the heart of a dingy alley behind the Orpheum um, with a public interactive art piece. Here's the cool thing about this one. We didn't have enough money to build this. So we went out to the public with a Kickstarter campaign. We asked for $35,000. We said, if you guys want this space, if this is something you want for your city, for your city, not my city, not HCMA's city, your city, then put your money where your mouth is. 
And we had over 450 co people commit and contribute to the campaign. And when we closed the doors on it, three weeks later, we had $67,000 in the coffers. And so this is going ahead. This is getting built right now. You can go down there. It's, it's the throne paint up on the walls. But there's one thing I need to talk about here, which, which scared the daylights out of me at the beginning of this project uh, and was my biggest fear before we embarked on this. And that is, you and I all know that um, there's, there's people in our city who aren't as fortunate as we are. People in our city that call uh, alleyways home. It's the place where they do business, where they do uh, work, where they live and play. And the last thing that I wanted this to do was to take that space away from people that really needed it and hand it over to a bunch of privileged people uh, who could afford to take a couple hours off at lunchtime to play basketball. So I want to introduce you to a gentleman named Rob. Rob is a binner, and he lives in Aleut. And one day, one of my colleagues um, had the good fortune of traveling through the alleyway on his way to work, and Rob was in a bin, and he popped out. And he said, and he said um, so my colleague asked him, he said, what's going on here? What have they done? And, uh, and Rob said, it's crazy. They've, they've completely changed it. They've, they've painted everything. It's a totally different space. So my colleague asked him another question. He said, okay, that, 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 that sounds great, but is it, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? Like, how's this impacting you? And what he said next absolutely floored me. Well, first he said, he held up a banana and he said, well, the food sure has gotten better. <laughs> <laughs> but what he said next, I'll never forget. He said, kids now come up to me in this space. They'll talk to me. They ask me questions. They never did that before. It's a space now. I feel like I'm part of a community now. It's a, it's a democratic space where I can belong, where, I, where people feel comfortable engaging me in a conversation. So when we talk about building cities and, and cities belonging to people, we need to remember one thing and be absolutely crystal clear on this, and that is that cities belong to all people. They belong to you, they belong to me, they belong to our children, and they most certainly belong to people like Rob. All of you have spaces in your mind that are going through your mind, uh, the vacant lots or the hidden corners of your city. I want you to think about those spaces, and I want you to ask yourself, how could those spaces be different if they were places for people? I want you to ask yourself the what-if question. And this isn't going to be easy. This is hard work. It takes courage. It takes commitment. It takes risk. But here's why it's worth it. This is my son. This is me 30 years ago. I owe it to him to give him a city that he belongs in, that he finds the same wonder and inspiration in that I did. You owe it to your children. We owe it to, to the people in this room. We owe it to the next generation to ask the what-if question and then to do something about it. Thank you.